Good morning, church. Welcome to worship here in this virtual way at the Congregational Church of Middlebury. We are a member of the United Church of Christ, and we are an open and affirming church, which means no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here just as you are. Jesus didn't turn anyone away, and neither do we. Before we begin our worship, I want to lift up a few announcements. There are some really exciting in-person events that I want to bring your attention to. Starting today, this morning at 11.30 a.m., there will be some fellowship hours going on all around Middlebury. There are still plenty of spots left if you want to sign up, uh, there will be a link in our Facebook comments right now for you to see what's open, sign your name, and then show up to one of these houses where you can enjoy some fellowship with your fellow church members. Make sure to bring your own chair and your own mask. Also, we're really, really, really excited to share with you that we will be having our first outdoor worship service this coming Sunday, September 20th at 2 p.m., we're really grateful for Janet and Churchill Franklin for offering your property for us. Come sign up first and worship together with our whole selves. Um, this surely will be a joyful event and I hope you all can make it. Now friends, before we begin our worship, I'd invite you to start with a centering prayer to silence and quiet your hearts and minds. Amen. Please join me for the call to worship. Welcome, you who are weak, may here you find a sanctuary. Welcome, you who are certain, may here you be challenged. Welcome, you who are unconvinced, here may your questions be heard. Welcome, you who honor God by abstaining, here may you receive the God's good gifts. Welcome, you who live for yourselves. Here may you find what is worth your whole life. Welcome, you who live for the Lord. Here may you judge not, but give an account only to the God of the dead and the living.
let us enter into a time of confession. Confessing is like walking into a dark cave, seeing nothing, hearing nothing. We do not know what we will find there. Maybe we will find the bones of things long dead. Maybe we will find the living wings of a bat or the thousand feet of some worm thing. Maybe we will find the silence not at all quiet, but full of unknown rustles. Maybe we will find ourselves and find old hurts or desires that are long dead and find the thousand feet of some urge or temptation that could carry us away in a heartbeat. But it is only in the deepest dark that we can see the tiny light that is always present, that sliver that comes from an unknown place, that sliver of light that gives us hope that sliver of light that looks a bit like grace. It is only in the stillest silence that we can hear the whisper of mercy. Let us enter into silence. Friends, sisters and brothers, hear this good news and see the grace of God. You are forgiven. You are free to go and live in the light of love. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning, children. I'm really happy to be here with you. Do you know what today is? It's Welcome Sunday. And although it may look a little different than usual, like a lot of things these days, it is still happening. And I think it's important for us to remember that no matter what, we have to keep moving forward. I hope that you and your family will be able to join me later today outside at church for a special event. The pastors 
your teachers, and I are excited to see you. And we have a sweet treat, and we have some pretty cool tote bags for you to take home. I know that we will not be meeting in person for church school this fall, but I've come up with some ways that we can stay connected. Do you guys remember this tote bag that I would use during my children's messages? Well, I thought it would be pretty cool if you all had your own tote bags. So every family is gonna get a tote bag. It won't be pink or look like this. They're all a little different. But it will be filled with some cool stuff. Do you want to see what's inside? I do. So every child is going to receive their own keychain. And I want you to put this keychain on your backpack for school as a reminder that your church is thinking about you, that we're praying for you, and that God is with you. Every family is gonna get one of these booklets called, I Love to Live the Story. I love to live the story. We have spent a lot of time since March looking at the calendar. Some of us wondering, what day of the week is it? Others looking, saying, how did we get to September? And more recently, probably, how much longer is this going to go on? I thought it would be neat for us to take a look at a different type of calendar. Did you know that the church has its own calendar? It does. And this booklet is all about the church calendar. It talks about what the different seasons are and why we celebrate them. Maybe what colors are typically used and some other fun facts that you can learn together as a family. Each family will also receive some glitter sidewalk chalk. Art is a wonderful way of expressing yourself. It's also an easy way to make the world a more beautiful place. Over the next few months, I'm gonna ask you to create some art about Bible stories and then take pictures of them and send them to me. Everyone will also receive a prayer stone. This one says, pray always. Let the stone be a reminder to pray because I think it's easy sometimes for us to forget to pray. And sometimes we forget God is listening. You could also make a pretty fun game out of this with your family and whoever has the stone in front of them at dinner time gets to say grace that evening. Do you guys remember these? They're the children's church bulletins. You used to get one when you would come into the sanctuary with a box of crayons and go to your pew. Well, Judy Albright was kind enough to make copies for everyone for the entire month of September. Thank you, Judy. And last, but certainly not least, you're gonna get a sticker booklet called The Miracles of Jesus. And I'm gonna make a monthly video about one of the miracles where I tell the story and I maybe do an arts and craft project with you. And you can access that video anytime during the month that you want. And we'll go over these miracles together. When September's all done, I'll stop by your house with some new activities for October. And that will give me a chance to stop and say hello and see how you're doing. I know that we would all prefer 
to be in church together. I get that. I really, really do. But in the meantime, I hope that the totes will remind you that I'm thinking of you, I'm praying for you, and I'm missing you. Will you please join me in a prayer? Dear Creator, thank you for our ability to stay connected in different ways. Please bless us and our community as we continue down this bumpy road. We are grateful that you are always with us and with that knowledge, we will not be afraid. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I hope to see you later today. A reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 23 through 35. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knee before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servants just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should show pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Sunlight, it's the great disinfectant. Sunlight, the great disinfectant. Now, I can hear your collective groans through the computer. I know, and trust me, I am not trying to echo the words of fake news peddlers about how to um, stay safe and effectively from COVID-19. Sunlight, the great disinfectant. This phrase was actually first coined by Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis to describe and advocate for more financial and government transparency as a means to fight corruption. But still, I'm not talking about anti-corruption. I'm not talking about public health, nor am I talking about public policy, but public confession, a theological truth-telling, a personal acknowledgement of guilt, an admission of our failings, sunlight, the great disinfectant. In her new podcast called The Confessional, Lutheran pastor, writer, theologian, and overall hardcore human Nadia Boltz-Weber makes space for the kind of sunlight I'm talking about. Since April of this past year, Boltz Weber has invited people to share with her on her podcast some of the ways that they, in short, have profoundly failed. These guests reveal big transgressions, including extreme homophobia and even murder. 
Nadia Boltz Weber, herself a recovering alcoholic and former stand-up comedian, now celebrity pastor known most for her success in starting the radically open Lutheran Church House for All Sinners and Saints in Colorado, embodies this theological idea that people who have done depro- deplorable things can change. Human transformation is possible. It just needs to come to light. Boltzweber likes to call her public confessional booth a car wash for your secrets. In other words, by simply holding space for people to share their ugliest actions, their shame, their darkest secrets, and to share how their lives have been changed as a result, well, their vulnerability can free them and those of us listening. As I listened to her recent interview this past week, an old tune started playing in my head. A tune that sounds like a thing called grace. There's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. Grace. The thing that stirs inside of us when we hear someone normalize our greatest fear or our greatest secret and our shame is wiped away, making room for something else to grow in its place. Grace, the thing when the floodlight, the sunshine shines upon or squarely lands upon the worst parts of us and a clearing opens up, something new breaks forth. Grace. That thing that looks like 70 times 7 times. That thing that looks like an analogy of a king forgiving a debt equivalent to the GDP of a small country. Grace. I think you know a little bit about it too. And Matthew, our gospel writer, I think knows something about it as well. For, as we heard Margaret read this morning, Matthew writes to a community that's desperately trying to figure out how to stick together in the midst of their many differences. A community that knows Christ, but doesn't know how quite to live and serve him in community. This 18th chapter in Matthew is all about how to be this new thing called church. And Peter's question to Jesus says it all. If another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? We hear that Jesus answers, not seven, but 70 times seven. Or in other translations, 77 times. While we can easily do this kind of math, The point is that forgiveness isn't something that you can quantify. Forgiveness, it seems, in the kingdom of heaven is a quality of mind and heart, an ongoing way of walking, a skill set for living, 70 times 7. And Matthew continues with a story that to our modern ear sounds distressing. Slavery, torture, debts, punishment. Even in Jesus' time, I think this would have been a story that would have shocked the hearers out of their own limited imaginations or understanding of who God is and the way that they're meant to be a community of faith who follows Christ. This story, naming absurd dollar figures and dramatic acts of redemption and punishment, was meant, I think, to clear a new imaginative path for Matthew's community, a new way of comprehending a God who is radically merciful and asks us to do the same. Now I have to admit, there's a lot to love about this gospel story and a lot that I wrestle with, especially in our current climate. This story about Jesus compelling us to forgive, well, Obviously, it's good advice most of the time. But, like so many stories in our sacred texts, this one has been used to harm victims of violence and abuse. 
because of this text, some women have been told to stay with their abusive partners. People of color have been expected to move on from centuries of oppression because if they were good Christians, they would forgive. Forgiveness has been deployed by Christians over time to fend off questions about power, justice, repentance, and lament. And this is true especially now in the United States, where the pressing call for racial equality and healing is too often met in the church by premature demands for forgiveness. Unsurprisingly, we humans have weaponized the scripture that was meant to be liberative, not a tool for oppression. This gospel forgiveness Jesus is describing here, well, I really do believe that it is not an obligation of a victim, but instead the first step towards healing, transformation, and justice. It's about naming the ugliness and bringing it to the sunlight. For, as writer Debbie Thomas describes, the starting line of forgiveness is the acknowledgement of wrongdoing, of harm, of real and profound violation. Whenever we talk about the need for forgiveness, we must begin by recognizing and naming the extent of the brokenness. Why? Because we were created for good. We were created for love, equality, tenderness, and wholeness. As image bearers of God, we were made for a just and nurturing world that honors our dignity. And when we experience any deviation from that basic goodness, it is appropriate, it is human and healthy and Christian to react with horror. To discern the line between forgiveness and demanding reparation, between forgiveness and righteous anger at injustice, between forgiveness and calling for real change. Well, that's a lifelong Christian project. And as usual, our God doesn't work within these false binaries that we prop up. Thank goodness that God is bigger than that. God moves within the paradox, the messy, the in-between, and imagines for us and with us a future of freedom and liberation and wholeness. I really believe that God's mercy and grace can be found and seen in beautiful glimpses when we have the courage to name our feelings, bring them to the light of day, and see how, with some work on our part, God can transform them. Imagine this paradox. We, God's people, profoundly fail, and yet we were made for good. We are good. The thing is, God has known this about us for a very long time. And still, God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. And thanks be to God for that. Amen.
The gift of time, the gift of know-how, the gift of passion, the gift of attention, that beautiful undivided attention, the gift of money, the gift of listening and the offering of prayer, the gift of good company in times of need. Each of us brings gifts to this community every day. I give thanks to God for that. I give thanks to God for you. Thank you, friends, for bringing your best to our community, especially now, but truly always. Thank you.
Let us take a moment of silent prayer as we enter into our congregational prayer this morning. Let us pray. God of abundance, in an overflowing of grace, you stretch our imaginations, the boundaries of what we deem possible, turning scarcity into abundance with overflowing grace, mercy, love, and forgiveness, for expanding and breaking through our limited imaginations. God, you don't bless us because we are deserving. We all miss the mark in what we do and don't do. Still, thankfully, your grace meets us where we are, making the most common things holy, at times even our own lives. Through the Spirit of Jesus Christ, that grace abounds even in uncertainty and doubt. Thank you, God, for such an unfailing gift. At the same time, we ask, Holy One, that you be a balm to those suffering this day. For those on the West Coast, dealing with the horrifying reality of fire, smoke, heat, loss of property, and loss of life. For those struggling with addiction, mental illness, recovery, especially during these isolating times. We ask that you make whole all who are unwell in mind, body, or spirit, especially those receiving difficult diagnoses this week. Surround them and the people who hold them dear with care and comfort. God, tend to those whose loved ones have died, especially the Thurber and Crampton families who this weekend mourn the loss of beloved church member, Betty Thurber. Comfort them and all of us as we give thanks for Betty's life and mourn her passing. Hold us all, God, in the complexities of loss. Holy One, as we face more challenges all at once in this time than many generations before us, empower us to address what we can and enable us to do your will on earth as it is in heaven. Point us in the direction of justice and put our hands to work where our passions are to address the economic, climate, gender, and racial inequities in our midst. Even when the problems feel beyond us, help us to see how our destiny is shared. Convict, stir, agitate us to action to join along the justice journey of our ally and friend, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Siblings in Christ, go and shine brightly. Shed sunlight everywhere you look and everywhere you go. In partnership with God, through practices of honesty and confession, through extensions of mercy, through resistance that heals and transforms, we glimpse, glimpse the heavens and the kingdom draws near. In the company of the Spirit, we are sent to join the menders of this world. In the name of God, our Creator, Jesus, our Redeemer, and the Holy Spirit, our Sustainer, go now in peace to love and serve God. Thanks be to God. <laughs>